Good morning, church. Happy Easter. It's good to see all of you here this morning, especially our visitors. We're so grateful and thankful that you're here, that we have families all together. Um, let me see if I can get these slides to work. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to continue our sermon series, A Father's Warning, a warning, rather, a father's warning, and our study through 1 Corinthians. In the month, month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, the king of the Persians, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. And as the cupbearer, Nehemiah, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. You see, the cupbearer was, pass- was responsible for passing the wine of the king to him, for making sure that the wine of the king was not poisoned. And if the one who's responsible for making sure your well-being is safe, and he looks sad, he looks disconcerted, it's often concerning. And so when the king noticed Nehemiah's disposition, he asked, he said, What is the issue, Nehemiah? What is going on? Why is your face, which has never in my presence before, why is your face downcast? Nehemiah, trembling, said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you be back? It pleased the king to send me, so I said, I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. And we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're about three sermons in, and we looked at chapter 1, uh, not last week, the week before, we looked at chapter 1, about verses 5 through 9, and Paul made it really clear. He pointed out to the congregation there, a congregation beset by trouble, a congregation beset by difficulty, a congregation where, quite frankly, none of us in this room would likely want to place membership. And Paul looks at this congregation, and he says, In God you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God, thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, Paul makes it clear. I know who is at work in you. But Paul, don't you understand? We have all this sin. We have all this trouble. We have all these problems. Paul says, yeah, I got that. I know. It's to be expected. But understand that you are still my brothers and sisters. Understand that God ultimately is at work and in you. And then the critics rise up and they say, well, if God's going to do it, I'll just stay home. If God's going to work, if God's the one at work, then what do I need to do? If God's the one who's moving and grooving and bringing his son and redeeming people and washing people in the blood and doing all the things, what part could I possibly have? This is where we pick up in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, Paul. 
Back it up. Why didn't you just end the letter after verse 9? Go back. If you're in your Bible, go back and look at verse 9. He very clearly says, it's the Lord who will keep you firm to the end. The Lord will keep you blameless. God is faithful. So what are you doing, Paul? Why are you still talking if God's the one at work? See, church, this goes all the way back to the garden. See, in the garden, Genesis chapter 1, it's God and his spirit who descends over chaos. It's God and his spirit who hovers above the waters. This is a representation of chaos and evil, darkness and death the forces of uncreation. God hovers over these forces and he takes them and he changes them and he creates life. He creates order. He creates stability. He gives us a firm place to stand. And then he creates man. And he creates them in his image, male and female. And he sets them about a task. He sets them about a job. And he says, you now be my ambassadors. You now work with me. You now come alongside me. And together, we will bring order and life to the cosmos. You see, Paul understands that the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross, that the ultimate goal of Christ was to bring man back into this relationship with God. Christ's ultimate objective was to make sons of God. Him being the chief son of God. Him being the primary son of God. Him being the firstborn of the sons of God. And in his actions, he demonstrated what that means and how that works. He said to the Jews who looked at him, he said, who doubted him and who fought with him, he looked at those Jews and he said, I always say what my father would have me say. I always do what my father would have me do. He looked at those Jews in the first century and he said, your father is not Abraham, your father is the devil. Because he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And you're nothing but liars and murderers. True sons of God stand up and live as God would have them live. They say what God would have them say. So notice, What another son of God, what Paul, redeemed and washed in the blood, a murderer, a persecutor of the church. Look at how he deals with these brothers and sisters who've gone astray. He acknowledges that ultimately, church, it is God's work. But knowing that it is God's work and grabbing on to the redemption that Jesus Christ brought by the blood on the cross... Knowing these things, Paul looks at them and says, I appeal to you. I urge you. Please. Later on, he'll call these people children, his children in the faith, like a father pleading to his children, please. Brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, see, by the authority, that's what that in the name means. Right? When Peter looked at the Jews at Pentecost, he said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ. By his authority, by his power. It's because of the Lord Jesus, by his authority and by his power. Remember Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus came to the disciples and said, I've been given all authority under heaven and earth. Therefore, go. This is what going looks like. Paul looks at his brothers and sisters as he says, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Who grew up in the churches of Christ here? If you grew up in the churches of Christ, raise your hand. All right. That's the easiest thing in the world, right, church? To be perfectly united in everything we say in mind and thought? That works out all the time, doesn't it? Come on, if you've been in the Church of Christ for a hot minute, does that work? By the authority of Jesus Christ, does that work? Does it work like that? Or does Brother Big Shot sometimes catch you in the hallway and say something mean and nasty? 
Does sister know it all sometimes catch you in the hallway and say something you don't want to hear? What am I talking about? I'm not going to ask you to show of hands, but I imagine some of us in this building have lived through a church split. Our elder, Dan Spaeth, will talk about the last one that Central experienced and how he watched the devil walk in the room and sit down right in the front pew. Some of you were here for that. Some of you saw that. See, this is what is going on at Corinth. You see, when he says divisions, the word there, what it's really talking about is something that's been ripped open or ripped apart. The idea is like a body has been dismembered. And when he says over here, when he says that all of you agree with one another in what you say, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought, what's really in view here is what's been ripped apart needs to be mended back together. See, what this isn't saying is that we have to agree with one another perfectly. And it seems like it's saying that, but that's not what's in view. How do I know? Because Paul went to the church in Rome and he said, if you want to keep a day, keep it for the Lord. He says, if you want to eat only meat, then eat only meat. If you want to eat only vegetables, then eat only vegetables. Just don't look down on your brother or sister who is restrained. If you have freedom, don't look down on your brother or sister who is restrained. Then he'll go to the Galatian church, and he'll condemn the Galatian church for those very same practices. So what's going on? It's quite simple, church. Being perfectly united is not about agreeing on every single thing. Church, we're never going to agree on every single thing. We're Americans, for goodness sake. Come on now. Come on now, and we're Texans to boot. If, we had, if that was what made us Christians, that we agreed on every single thing, none of us have any hope. When I served in the military, I met a guy from Indiana, and uh, I was from, I jo- when I joined the military, I lived in McAllen, Texas. If you don't know where McAllen, Texas is, it's deep south Texas, right on the border of Mexico. I throw a rock, and it's hitting Mexico, you know. I worked in a city called Hidalgo, Texas, and this was years ago as a paramedic, and we would outside, we would watch Border Wars on the TV. If you're familiar, if you're not familiar, I think it's Border Wars. It's, it, they followed the Border Patrol around, right? And um, we'd watch that Border Wars show on the TV, and we, we'd look out the window, and we'd see them running on the TV and running, running in the window, the illegals coming across the border. That's how close we were to the border, okay? I lived in deep south Texas. Now, I met a guy from Indiana. I didn't forget what I was talking about, I promise. Met a guy from Indiana... And, uh, well, I'm from Texas, and, and, you know, we're better than everybody else. I don't know if you knew that, church. We're better than all these yuppie Yankee states, states up there. If you're from one of those Yankee states, it's okay. Welcome to Texas. You're, you're good now. Um, my dad is from Buffalo, New York, so, yeah. Anyway, so I was, I was doing all the Texas things, pointing all those things out, and I met another guy who, who said he was from South Texas, and I asked him, I said, you're from South Texas? Oh, what, what? Where, where in South Texas? And he goes, San Antonio. <laughs> Get out of here. I looked at that guy and said, San Antonio, you're from Central Texas, man. I'm from 400 miles south of you. How are you going to say you're, in so- you're from South Texas? Kids, this guy doesn't know anything. And the dude from Indiana, my, my, my friend from Indiana in the military, looked at me and he said, you Texans can't even get along with each other. <laughs> the perfect unity that Paul is talking about here The perfect unity that he's talking about here is not unity in the sense that we agree with everything, absolutely everything everyone's ever going to say. You know, we're having a discussion right now, to give you behind the scenes look, we're having a discussion right now about changing out doorknobs. We don't all agree. Doorknobs, church. We don't all agree. We had a discussion about the annex, about how are we going to remodel, are we going to put tile in? going to change the, the, the sheetrock on the wall, you know, what color are we going to paint it? If you think we all agree, you're out of your mind. We don't all agree. And that's okay, church. That's not what he's talking about. Because while I may, Brother Jim, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, okay? While I may not agree with Brother Jim, he's my brother. 
And I love him. And I love him because Christ died for him. And my Lord, my King, my God shed his blood for him. And so while we might not see eye to eye on every issue, while me and my sister Pam, who's our church secretary, might not see eye to eye on every issue, and I'll tell you why we don't right now. She's been doing this for 30 years and I just showed up. And she knows way better than I do. But I've got to figure it out. And they're patient with me. All of you in this room are patient with me. A new Christian, a new preacher, a new minister. Why? Because the sacrifice of our God on that cross. Because the blood he has shed for us. Because we are one family. That's what Paul is talking about here. It breaks his heart to watch a congregation destroyed by all of these different ideas and these different desires and all of these things. And Paul recognizes the one at work. Because really the one at work is the author of lies and murder. The original liar, the original murderer, the enemy. And the second we forget, church, the second we forget that every single one of us in this room has, who has obeyed the gospel, has been bathed in the blood of Christ, who has been washed clean, is a son or daughter of the king, is known by God and loved by God, the second we forget that, we fail. Because what I want becomes more important than what you want. And what you want becomes more important than what I want. What Paul desperately desires for this church are these Christians who are able to give up themselves, surrender themselves to their brothers and sisters. And a wonderful example of that is given in Ephesians chapter 5, where in verse 21, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, within that context, he's giving an example. He's going to use an example between husbands and wives. But church, it still applies in the church. You learn how to submit to one another. You learn how to give in to one another in the family. That's where we primarily learn it. And then we bring it into the church. But if you're paying attention, you know we have so many broken families. And so we should understand, church, that the problems that we experience in our congregations are going to be that much more severe. Because people just don't know how to give in to one another anymore. People don't know how to be a servant anymore. So he says to you, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought and then he says, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. See, the problem here, he says in verse 12, give me, get, let me get through this. It says in verse 12, you know, Chloe's household has informed us of this, and then what I mean is this. So this is what I mean by the quarrels. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Wouldn't the problem in Corinth, these divisions and factions, this is not a theological issue. This is not things like, well, so and so follows John Calvin, and so and so follows Luther, and so and so follows Wingili or John Huss or Arminian. That's not the issue. All of those guys, the differences between those guys are theological in nature. Calvin believes one thing about the saints and about the church and about God and his plan of redemption. Arminian believes something else. Our Catholic friends down the street, they believe something else. This is not an issue of theological discourse. You know how I know? Because Paul's going to say each one of these teachers is meant for you. And in the book of Galatians, where a, there is a major theological issue, you have Christians trying to earn their salvation, okay? In that book, Paul confronts the false teaching immediately. So this isn't about false teaching. This isn't about theology. What is this about then? Well, I like the way Apollos preaches. 
But Peter can't stand that guy. He's too Jewish for me. Oh, I like the way Paul says it. But I'm not interested in going to um, Cephas's Bible class. This is what's at issue here. It's a simple issue of favoritism. I like this teacher over this teacher. I like the way he says it over them. It's so bad. Look at verse 13. Is Christ divided? In other words, if Apollos wasn't showing up Sunday, well, I'm not going to church. Do we experience this today? Do we experience this today? Huh, let me see here. Man, I don't like the songs they're singing. I'm going home. True or false? Oh, who's preaching today? Oh, I don't like that. I'm going home. Tune out. Oh, is sister so-and-so serving in the kitchen this morning? I ain't going. I ain't going to be there. Forget that. Does it happen? Church, it happens all the time. It happens all the time the time. It's so bad that Paul has to ask, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Look at verse 14. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Have you ever heard a preacher say that? I am so glad I didn't baptize anybody. Thank God for that. How bad are these factions? People have wrapped up their salvation. They've wrapped up their understanding. They've wrapped up their spiritual walk in people less, in people other than Christ. Do we do that? Do we do that today? Church, if your faith is dependent on me, you're going to be mistaken. You're going to be sadly, sadly disappointed. If your faith is wrapped up in Brother Spaeth, you're going to be disappointed. If your faith is wrapped up in Brother Coburn, or Brother Marshall, or Brother Weidman, or Brother Smith, or Sister So-and-So, if your faith is wrapped up in anyone other than Jesus, you're going to be disappointed. Why? Because I'm going to fail you. I'm going to fail you. Who is here this morning to set up? Who's here? who's here? If you were here this morning to set up for Easter, raise your hand. And we got one who's willing to admit it. Uh, two who's willing to admit it. Was I here this morning? No, I was not. I was not here this morning. And I'm kicking myself. I wanted to be here, but I convinced myself that no one would be here. So I didn't want to get up. If your faith is resting on me, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to drop the ball. This is why Paul is so adamant about this. He's not saying that baptism doesn't matter here. He's not saying, this is the same guy who said, all of you who are baptized in Christ Jesus have clothed clothed yourself with Christ Jesus. For those of you who are baptized in Christ Jesus died with him and rose to walk in newness of life. This is the same guy who the scripture reading this morning we read, you know, all of us are united because of the baptism. So this isn't, this isn't about baptism as the importance or the significance of. That's not what's in view. What's in view here is this. You're so messed up on this that some of you might actually think you were baptized under my authority <coughs> rather than the authority of Christ. And then he ends it with this. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Is that a shocking statement for us, church? We talked about the problems of legalism earlier. We talked about how he confronts that in Galatians. And how you can turn a law, you can become a law unto yourself. And when you do that, you are no longer under the grace of Christ. That you have fallen away from that grace. Do you want to know what legalism looks like in the church today? It's a very easy thing. I see many Christians today talk about it, and it's this idea. I was working a funeral one day for a friend of mine, and I had, way down in Alice, Texas, and I had an individual come up to me after the funeral, 
And he looked at me and he said, he was probably in his 80s, and he looked at me and he said, I'm so glad when I was eight years old, I answered the altar call and I don't have to worry about death anymore. I'm so glad when I was eight years old, I'm going to say it another way. I'm so glad that when I was eight years old, I put the coin in the slot I gave God the required two pence, and now I get the thing he promised. You hear this all the time. I got, a, I got one young man shaking his head, good for you. I hear this all the time. I hear it said in different ways. I hear it said like this, well, I prayed a prayer one day. I prayed a prayer one day, and so now I'm good to go. God's going to take care of me. I hear it this way too. Well, I got baptized, so I'm good to go. I've done the thing, I've earned my keep, and now I'm done. I don't care what you substitute for that. I don't care from what tradition you come from and what you substitute, what, what works in that mix. If you think that you put a coin in a slot and you get the thing, that's not how any of this works. Because ultimately what Christ wants from every single one of us is this, he wants to be the chief thing in our life. I'm going to say it again. He wants to be the chief thing in your life. You know how I know that? Because he says, if you're not willing to hate your mother and your father, if you're not willing to hate your children, if you're not willing to leave everything behind and follow me, you are not worthy to be my disciple. Christ doesn't want a piece of you. He doesn't want a part of you. And he doesn't want your two pence. It's worthless. He wants you. He wants your loyalty. He wants your dedication. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to deny yourself and follow him. He wants you to give up everything you have, everything you are, everything you ever will be for him. You know why? Because he did it for us. He did it for us. Paul understands that. Which is why he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The gospel is the coming of the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we now have the church. And the good news is that in the kingdom of God, in the church, they're not necessarily the same thing, but we're not getting into that this morning. In the kingdom of God and in the church, that you can have forgiveness of sins, restoration of life, and redemption. But it's only by his power and his authority. Not with wisdom and eloquence, he says in verse 17. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This morning, this Easter, I want to remind us that the entirety of the kingdom of God, the entirety of the gospel message, the entirety of God's work on that cross, the work that spans millennium, a work that God set his mind to before the foundation of the world, was to save you. This is what God's been working for. And it's not to save you in some existential way. It's not to save you in some abstract way. He wants to save you from death. Because every single one of us in this room are destined to die. Because we've all sinned. And so he sent his son to die on that cross to save us from a death we rightly deserve. And in return... He wants us to walk with him. To make him the king of our lives and of our world. If you're here with us this morning and you've forgotten that that's what's at stake, that he doesn't want a part of you, he wants all of you. Or if you're here this morning and you don't know where you stand with Christ, you don't know the king like I do. But you want to know more. You want to know better. I'm going to be right back there in the prayer room. I've got elders standing up in the back. Whatever you need this morning, I ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.